I call the fifth regular common council meeting to order. Will the clerk please read the quote for today? Thank you, Alder Feldy. When you can't find the sunshine, be the sunshine. Oh, jeez. Would the clerk please call the roll? Alderperson Ackley. Here. Alderperson Decker. Here. Alderperson Feldy. Here. Alderperson Felicki Paneski. Here. Alderperson Heideman. Here. Alderperson Mitchell. Here. Alderperson Perella. Here. Alderperson Salazar. Here. Alderperson Rust. Here. Alderperson Ramey. Here. There are 10 present. Thank you. I ask that everyone stand for the Pledge of Allegiance if you are able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Approval of minutes. Alderperson Felicki Paninski, please. Uh, I move to approve the minutes of May 16th. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Chair says aye. Motion carried. Resignation. Um, I'm going to call on Attorney Chuck Adams to read the resignation. Yep. Thank you, uh, Alder Feldy. Uh, there is one resignation tonight, uh, Patricia Weisrock, who is resigning from the Board of Review effective immediately. I move to accept the resignation and file. Second. There's going to be a voice vote. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Uh, mayoral appointments. Um, again, Attorney Chuck Adams. Yes. So uh, the mayor uh, provides the following appointments to the members of the Common Council, submitting the following appointments for your confirmation. Alder Angela Ramey to be considered for appointment to the Public Works Committee. Alder Zach Russ to be considered for the appointment to the Architectural Review Board. Christine Campy to be considered for the appointment to the Library Board as the Sheboygan Area School District designee. Andy Ross to be considered for the appointment to the Board of Review. Stephanie Getz to be considered for the appointment to the Senior Service Commission. James Van Akron to be considered for the appointment to the Sustainable Task Force. Geraldine Leanna to be considered for an appointment to the Sustainable Task Force, Rebecca Clark to be considered for an appointment to the Sustainable Task Force, and Laura Hagen to be considered for appointment to the Sustainable Task Force. Thank you. That will lay over. Um, I'm going to ask the clerk if any if there's anyone for public forum. No one this evening. Thank you. We have a presentation, um, compensation study review um, from Patrick Lynn Carlson Detman. Good evening, everyone. Today we have Patrick Lynn joining us from Carlson Detman, the consultant engaged to complete a compensation study for all non represented or non union employees. This study touches all departments within the city from the library, city hall, public safety, transit to public works. Though Patrick will give an overview on the actual data processing and results of the study, I wanted to supply some context of how the project was completed on the city's side and why the project took longer than anticipated to complete. The original resolution had pa been passed by council in April of 2021. Each employee was asked to complete a job description questionnaire detailing their day-to-day -day job duties and responsibilities, including assigning percentages to the tasks required of them. In addition, staff was to provide information related to interactions with individuals inside and outside the organization, work environment, physical requirements, and the management role they hold. 
Once turned in, supervisors reviewed the questionnaires to make sure they, that they agreed with the information provided by the employees, but also filled in additional details that included minimum education, experience, and licensing required of the position. These questionnaires were then turned into Human Resources, who was in charge of final review and submission to the consultant. In August and September, department heads met with Carlson Detman and Human Resources to review the questionnaires and talk through the positions to make sure that there's a clear understanding of each job. Other than working with the finance department's questionnaires, I personally was not involved in the study until October. At that time, I was pulled in for reviewing the potential financial impacts of the different options of implementation. In November, when some staff changes occurred here at the city, I stepped in as the department head lead on this project. Over the past several months, there has been continuous reviews, reviews and con discussions to fine tune the scale, calculate costs of implementation, and be sure that all positions were evaluated. In May, Administrator Wolf and I met with department heads for their review of the draft schedule to make sure that their concerns were communicated to Carlson Detman before publication. Last Wednesday, I sent an email to all employees included within this study to inform them that the draft pay scale would be considered by finance and personnel tomorrow and additional communication will be coming dependent on future council action. I have been at the city for just over a year. Not only have I taken on this project for the Human Resources Department, but the finance team and I have been doing a lot of additional HR tasks to make sure the employees of the city are taken care of. It has been challenging to say the least. Due to the number of projects and tasks that have been required to be completed, this project took longer than any of us had anticipated. I understand that there has been frustration experienced by the council and employees related to this study. Please know that any lack of communication over results was not to be elusive or secretive. We wanted to make sure that the results were complete and thought through. I've spent countless hours reviewing and making sure that all the positions received the consideration they deserve. I feel confident with the efforts that have been put into this process. I know that not everyone will be happy with the results, but I do know from my experience that is normal for a compensation study or any time that wages are discussed. With that said, I believe this study can provide a baseline for the council to implementing a fair comp plan that can be built off of in the future. I will defer at this point to um, Administrator Wolf if he has any additional comments. Thanks, Director Krieger. First off, I want to make sure that I express my sincere appreciations to Director Krieger. This has been, um, she has just been here just over a year as she had stated, and, f and, and for all of the work that she has put into the, not only the pr this project, but the many other projects and areas as well. She has gone above and beyond the call of her job to make sure that this project made it to where it is, where we are today, where the council will, is able to hear at the results and consider adoption. In the past, municipalities were considered to, to be a, a ahead of other markets when it came to the overall compensation. Since Act 10 and the many changes that were implemented thereafter, municipalities have struggled to remain competitive in the job market, as we all know. This has been aspirated since 2010 with the market instability due to the pandemic and the great resignation creating an employee's market where higher compensation is required to retain and hire new employees. During the study, we also had fo have found that adjustments were made departmentally with human resources to create additional <clears throat> disparities uh, and unbalanced scales amongst positions. Moving forward, there will be a defined process to any changes uh, to the non-represented pay scale. This study uh, purpose, this study's purpose is to be sure that the city has a fair wage scale of non-represented staff compared to other similar employers. I must say that I'm very proud, again, very proud to say that we have some exceptional employees here at the city and we will not be able to serve members of our community without them. And again, throughout the city, that includes all departments throughout the city. Please note that this process is the start of our path in taking care of our present team 
so that we can be competitive and attract additional talent in the future. I will now turn over uh, to Patrick Glenn to present on the Carlson Detman process and the results of the study. Patrick? He's, he just noted he's having difficulty with his audio. He just lost the audio again. <laughs> While we're waiting for, for Patrick to come online, this will be a, um, a slimmed down version of the overall program, but the program will be sent out to all alders and the actual um, video site that was recorded during his original presentation and his original presentation, um, going by memory, but I believe that it's around 52 slides so this will be a, a slimmed down version for, for the council. 52. Thank you. 52. That's what I remember. Patrick, we can see you and we're ready for you, but I don't know if your audio appears to be off. We are having audio If somebody's got Patrick's uh, cell phone number, he just held up his uh, telephone on the screen. I don't know that everybody can see him, so I'm just giving you a play-by-play. -play. He's getting a technical difficulties message. Eric, do you want me to, I have, I have uh, Patrick's cell number. Should I just call it and then he can talk through my cell through into the mic? Are you able to hear me now? There we go. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. I was hearing everything and all of a sudden, right in the middle of Caitlin's description to you, it went completely blank, so I apologize for that. Um, I saw a message that it's up to me here. Um, I don't have screen control, so I'm gonna have to do the old fashioned next um, process here. And I can't see the screen. Am I able to share my screen? We may have just lost him. Patrick, the, I don't know if, what, if you're seeing what I'm seeing also remotely, but if you look at the WSCS screen, that is the screen with your... Uh, oh, God. Yep. That's going to be tough to see. Let's see. Trying to isolate one screen. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm having eye issues actually right now, so this is not... So anyway, I'm going to look at my presentation and talk to you at the same time here. So I, I apologize, I didn't get a chance to hear what Scott said, or, I'm sorry, Todd said. Um, but I will go through this hopefully relatively quickly, especially since we are kind of on a, in a time crunch now. But as we went through this process, and again, as Caitlin said, you know, I don't think anyone's necessarily thrilled with, with the pace that things went, but sometimes that's the way things um, go in, in this sort of a project, especially when we have um, turnover of staff throughout. 
But I think what's important as we look at this is in terms of talking about what the process is all about and what it's not about. And, and, and I think, especially from the standpoint of framing expectations and, 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 and managing those, that we went through this whole process and looked at every single job, um, non-represented job for that matter, um, as it relates to job content, um, regardless of you know, the, the individual's performance in that job, um, looking at the content of that particular position, looking at the marketplace and helping devise a, a competitive position, and then designing a pay structure that takes both factors into consideration, both the internal and the external factors. Um, I think what's just as important is what the process is not about. And, and one, we're not looking at how many jobs the city should have, and whether it's a department or as a whole, and, and that goes hand in hand with the workloads of those departments. Um, certainly it's something that has been discussed and will be discussed for, for probably time immemorial, um, but this is not a workload analysis, not a performance review, and nor is it an opportunity to, to cut wages of any given employee. And so we wanna make certain that we are um, covering that. And as we go through this, sometimes just taking a peek at the employee level demographics, um, if someone can change the slide here. Um, as every project, we look at two, two main cuts of, of information. Uh, the, the first one being the age of the employees, and I would say age profiles. Um, it helps give us a snapshot in terms of what the organization is up against as it relates to the, the turnover related to, to retirement. Um, I would say that probably the first number I would look at is that cumulative percentage, um, at least 30% of your employees um, are age 55 or older. Um, that's, again, about a third of your workforce is expected to retire at some point in the not too distant future. Um, you know, of course, and I always say this is that the, the eligibility to retire and the ability to retire, the desire to retire are all different factors. Um, but again, as we kind of look at what's anticipated, that's an important number. And if we look at age 50 or older, kind of those who have retirement at least on the horizon and um, you know, it, for an organization to begin planning, succession planning, those sorts of things, you know, over 40% of your organization is kind of on that track. Um, and this is not uncommon. I would say that about five years ago, that number was tracking closer to 50% across our public sector base. And over the last several years, especially during the pandemic, we saw a, a much larger number of retirees. And so about 40% is tracking with the rest of our, our um, public sector projects. As it relates to years of service, it's another metric that we try to track looking at this. And again, the average tenure in organizations, if you look at the BLS data is roughly five years of employment. Um, and so when we see that, um, next slide please. As we see that and we talk about it, um, less than five years of service at about 38%. Um, again, our public sector metric that we track is somewhere between 35 and 40%. Um, but again, our reason for doing that, and, and there are many reasons why employees stay with an organization. A, being one of those factors, um, culture, opportunities for advancement. We can keep going down the list of various things why people might stay with an organization. But having a competitive pay structure is, is probably one of those key things that reduces that, that temptation for people to look for alternative employment. And so we wanna make certain that for both of these factors, you wanna have a competitive wage structure for the anticipated recruitment that you're gonna be engaged in, as well as the existing employees and try to retain them in their, in their slots. And so when we do this, we, we look at a number of factors. And if we can skip ahead a couple of slides here um, to the total reward slide, that when we look at this, um, our practice, we, we look at this through the lens of total reward, like any other consultant who, who does this work should be doing, and I believe most do, that we look at it through the lens or our, our three-legged stool, I would say, you know, of compensation, benefits, and the employee experience. The primary focus of this project was the employee compensation piece. Again, as we talked about before, internal equity, the external competitiveness, and making certain that we marry those two things together using a common system. Um, that's not to say that benefits or experience aren't important. They're, they're incredibly important. And I would say they're even, even to the point of being equally important. 
but our primary, if not exclusive focus in this project was, was the compensation side of things. And in doing so, and then we talk about our compensation program, you know, we, we, we talk about a, a few things. And if we look at the next slide here, um, we want to make certain that we're aligning with the organizational strategy. And I think the first thing is that you want to be able to attract and retain qualified talent. Um, oftentimes we hear things like the best and brightest, um, those sorts of, of, of grandiose um, terms oftentimes that find their way into a uh, strategic plan or of sorts. Um, I think at the minimum being able to, to attract qualified talent and, and quality talent is, is a good starting point. When, again, we talk about equity, we talk about competitiveness. We also want to make certain that you're supporting the employees as it relates to growth, whether it is performance, um, that's not necessarily the focus of this process, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here, but also as employees' duties and responsibilities shift, the ability to have those jobs evaluated and, and, and reviewed. Um, as much as I say that compensation is the primary focus of this study, still need to have the conversation as it relates to those other two pieces, the benefits and, and the culture of the organization. Um, they can't be swept under the rug, but, but again, um, it, it's a comprehensive approach that, that really needs to be looked at. We wanna make certain that you're legally sound, that you're not taking illegal factors into account. Um, we'll talk about affordability as we weave our way through this. Um, understandable, but also something that you look at on a, on a semi-regular basis you know, in, in good times you know, every three, four years might be fine as it relates to measuring the marketplace. As it relates to an overall comprehensive study, um, hopefully this has a shelf life of at least a decade. Um, if, if it's again maintained, and we'll talk about what it takes to maintain a structure, something that is reviewed on, on a periodic basis to make certain that you are aligning with the marketplace. Um, and in doing so, and if I, again, I'll skip ahead here to a, a couple of slides. Um, as part of our process, again, we were challenged with reviewing each of the jobs and getting the job documentation to review that. Um, in, in doing so, we, we apply our point factor job evaluation system to look at every single one of the jobs. And in, in our system, um, there are five factors that we look at. And again, if you can skip ahead a couple slides, please. That every job we go through a, a series of factors and in this particular case there are five main factors that really where we are doing our work are in the 11 sub factors that occur but looking at the thinking challenges and problems that we are asking or that you are asking employees to resolve in the course of their work and then once you have a a set of um, information or you begin to establish those parameters in terms of the thinking challenges then we look at what decisions are they empowered to make and over what portion of the organization are they allowed to make decisions and in what role are they playing in that decision making process are they contributing information are they contributing you know input and 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 actually participating in that decision making process are they indeed the final decision maker we also look at the the interactions and communications that that classification is engaged in you know again the, the setting is it fairly limited to quite expansive and again each one of these has a spectrum or a continuum of, of rating levels that we can apply and appropriately evaluate each job. And with the interactions, the second portion of that is what is the impact of their communications and the flow of information or data or, or the like in the organization. Then those last two elements that we look at are probably the more traditional things that people think of. What is the work environment and what are the hazard factors that, that might apply to that job as well as the physical requirements of the job. And then that last piece, the formal education or preparation and experience required to qualify for that job. And again, we're not looking necessarily at the individual qualifications of each and every employee. Well, that can be useful and that can oftentimes provide us some guidance. We are looking at the, the, from the lens of if you were to fill that job tomorrow, what would you require? And so when we do that, if we can thank you that as we look at this and this is just a sample organization each one of these rating levels has a number and a letter or a common a couple of letters that really do mean something to us it looks like a, a jumble of alphabet and number soup up here but you know for example that supervisory classification kind of in the middle of, of those jobs that 6d in formal preparation and experience for example is 
a bachelor's degree and four to five years of experience. You know, one L essentially being the, the profile for an office job for work environment. So again, each one of those has a letter or number. Each of those letters and numbers has a point value attached to it, which we can then begin to build that hierarchy. Can you, so you can see those, those numbers on the, on the right-hand side for total points that we can begin to build your organizational structure based on those point values. Now, every once in a while, we have to take other factors into consideration. The two primary things um, that we have to look at at times are internal compression, salary compression. This almost always occurs within the police and fire ranks with the city. Every once in a while, other jobs, but again, we want to make certain that we have those aligned appropriately, especially as you look at trying to incentivize or encourage employees to promote through the ranks in those particular roles. Um, the other one would be market. You know, every once in a while, we will get a job where the market for that particular role is so far above and beyond that which we would um, otherwise place based on job evaluation that we have to take that into consideration. So again, being very mindful of that. But if I look at this next slide, you know, th this is just a snapshot of your organization's current pay practices for the benchmark job. And when I talk about a benchmark job, it's a job that we can confidently find in the marketplace where there's consistent matches from one organization to the next, oftentimes cities, sometimes, you know, it, it, I would say largely cities, but there are a number of jobs that might have also um, applicability to the private sector as well, especially as when you get to a lot of your office roles or some of your blue collar positions. But my first observation, and, and if I look at this, is that going across the bottom is our observation, which is the point factor job evaluation scores for each of those jobs. Going up the left-hand side of that chart is the current pay for employees. And by and large, the organization is situated pretty well in, as it relates to internal equity. Yes, there's variance off that line. And quite honestly, there will always be variance off that line because you're, you're looking at individual pay as opposed to um, the pay structure itself. But it appears very clearly that as jobs increase in responsibility and, and education or environment, there's a corresponding increase in, in, in compensation. So this is usually a good place to start when we see that there's at least some relationship to um, the way we view the world and, and, and way you, you've compensated those positions. And as we look at this and with the next slide here, you know, there are many reasons why a number might vary from that line, whether it's the market, education, the location in some organizations where location is definitely a factor, tenure, job evaluation points, performance. But the thing that we are not taking into consideration, I think it's quite important, are any of the illegal factors such as race, age, or sex. And in fact, I, we kind of, um, every once in a while we'll have the opportunity to, to work for an organization in Minnesota. And the reason why I like that is in the public sector in Minnesota, they have pay equity legislation that requires the job evaluation system to be validated to ensure that it's not taking any illegal factors into account. And, and we're quite proud of the fact that when, when we do have those projects that we pass with flying colors for that particular testing process. In terms of the marketplace, I think one of the things that we've, we've talked about quite um, extensively in our work is that there are really two marketplaces that we're talking about. There's a ton of overlap between the two, but that, that notion of the comparable marketplace, you know, who is like us? Who have we traditionally compared ourselves to? A lot of times that is, you know, if back to the bargaining days, you know, who are the comparables for that perspective? Who is like you as it relates to population? Who is like you as it relates to other, you know, things such as property valuation, those sorts of things. But the other factor is, is, is a competitive marketplace in which you're situated. You know, and again, I don't need to, to tell you where you're situated. You know that quite well. But the reality is sitting between you know, Milwaukee and Green Bay, there are abundance of opportunities for employees and for employment. And so making certain that we're taking that into account as well as we're looking at this, as well as the fact that for many of your classifications, especially I would say for your advanced technical, your professional, even your supervisor or management job, that marketplace might be a little bit more broad than just a, a, a local area. And so as we look at this, you know, with this next slide, we had a very um, comprehensive listing of communities to which we drew comparisons. Um, 
what I forgot to include on here, um, but is included, are the, the immediate surrounding counties, um, you know, for some of those roles, making certain that we included county level data for jobs like, you know, um, streets labor and, and those sorts of roles. Because again, that's a highly competitive role. We wanna make certain that we're capturing that. We also, for jobs that where there are private sector um, equivalents, or at least um, semi-equivalents in some cases, you know, we're very careful about doing so, but we have other data at our disposal Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes data, pay factors, comp data, Willis Towers, Watson are all sources that we pay for and make certain that, again, they're aligning with the particular roles to which we're matching. And then for a handful of your jobs, the American Water Works Association also conducts a salary survey that we are able to use for some of your, your water and wastewater jobs um, within the city. And so in doing so, um, our, our next view of the world is that you know, a very similar graph, um, a little bit different line here. Um, and this is just simply the same exact job that you saw in that prior graph. But instead of your current pay, what we're substituting on this particular graph is the market rates of pay for those various classifications. And the, the, my first observation as we look at this is it's very tight to the line. Um, we're, we're happy when that happens. It gives us a high degree of confidence in the model that we're using to build your compensation structure. And we can then come back to you with a pretty high degree of confidence. We start recommending pay practices or, or, or design of a pay structure. Um, one of the things that I think um, is, is important, if we can go to this next slide here, it's a little bit busy, but I'll walk through it because I think it's important, that we looked at your pay from a couple different angles, and we went through this quite extensively with the Finance Committee, but that gray line is are your current, I'm sorry, is, is the average 50th percentile marketplace, or the median marketplace also, is also known as that. When we talk about the median marketplace, we talk about half of the organizations paying more, half of the organizations paying less. That's just by definition what the median um, entails. That black line is your current rates of pay. So if you look at that, your current pay is slightly, ever so slightly above the market. And in fact, I would tell you that that's about as close to being dead on the market as you're going to get. Is It's in our observation that your pay structure has been tested to its limits where your, your current employees are being paid fairly, I mean, there's no question about that, but at the same time, um, you're, you're in a highly competitive marketplace. And as Caitlin alluded to in her introductory comments, and we've talked about these roles, we've talked about the market quite extensively over the last several months. And one of the things that was apparent to us is you are you're experiencing difficulty in recruiting and retaining employees. And I don't think you're any different than most employers out there and so as we talked about this, we had to devise a methodology to give you a competitive compensation structure. I think the first thing that I would say, and I'll, I'll, we'll see this in a, a moment here on a different slide, but we know that the market's going to continue to move. It has moved quite extensively, um, probably to the point at times where our surveys and our own data collection can't always keep up. Um, and if I were to recommend a structure to you three years ago, or if I were to do it in the future, you know, three years from now, I would have recommended quite confidently the 50th percentile, the median marketplace. Knowing that we are in a state of change and we know that the public sector is gonna be, I would say this fall, is gonna be having very deliberate conversations in the various um, council chambers, county boardrooms, whatever it might be, that, how are we going to continue to compete as budgets are developed? And so in this case, I also show two other lines on this graph. The green line is indicative of the 75th percentile of the marketplace. Basically, 75% um, of the organizations are gonna pay less than that line, 25% are gonna pay more. That's pretty close to the upper bounds that we traditionally worry about is you, usually the maximum of a pay structure is, is set at the 75th percentile. Our recommendation for this structure, and I'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, is taking the 75th percentile and the 50th percentile data and averaging those to kind of give you that little nudge towards market competitiveness. 
And the example I used when we were discussing with the committee the other evening, and I think it, it, it's a pretty apt um, comparison, is that just imagine that you were watching a race. And in, my, in fact, I, I thought about this when my son was running track this last spring, that you know you would watch a kid go out and and go gangbusters, you know, for the first you know half a lap or full lap, and you think to yourself, you know, okay, the pack is going to catch up to them, and lo and behold, the pack catches up to them. I, I, I view this being exactly the same approach. Is that I'm reasonably confident that the pack even placing this at the blue line, the average of the 50th and 75th, if we were to fast forward a year to two years, I truly do believe that the pack is going to catch up to you. And if we were to reassess the market at that point, you're going to be a lot closer to the median market by establishing your pay structure at that blue line. And it's not putting the foot completely on the gas that that green line would indicate. So I, I spent a little bit of time on this, but I think it's also necessary to know why we're recommending what it is we are recommending. And if I go to slide 20 here, um, this is probably a good example. Um, World at Work, which is our professional association for compensation professionals, is they do a survey every couple of years and they ask organizations about their pay practices. And the goal for most organizations, you know, in this particular case, about 77% of organizations have the goal of building their structure at the 50th percentile. Um, you have another 11% that are going above that. And what you will see is that in practice, you know, again, the best of intentions sometimes doesn't always lead to, to you know, actual practice, you know, that two thirds of organizations roughly are actually building their structures at the 50th percentile, but you're seeing a few more kind of nudge upwards. I would also note that as we were um, coming out of the pandemic, SHRM, the Society of Human Resources Management last summer, um, wrote an article kind of on the after effects of the pandemic as it relates to compensation. And one of the things that they indicated, and I think it aligns with what we're trying to do, is that maybe for the time being, the 50th percentile isn't the ideal marker for, for building a pay structure. And again, with the pressures we're seeing, we're, we're trying to do the best we can to keep organizations in a competitive position. In terms of the structure itself, um, there's a few things I want to, to touch on. Um, first of all, um, traditionally, we would, if I were to pull a pay plan off the shelf in terms of the structure, it would normally be an 11 step structure from, with two and a half percent steps, five steps below the midpoint, five steps above. It would take an employee approximately um, 10 years to get from minimum to maximum. Because we are keenly aware of the, the financial challenges organizations are facing and, and the desire to have a, a plan with longer shelf life and knowing that um, structural increases have to be balanced with, with movement through the structure. And I have, the next slide will talk about that. But in terms of the design itself, we, we do firmly believe that employees starting at the minimum, and we know that the minimum is not always, oh, can we go back to slide here? I'm sorry. It's not always possible to start an employee at the minimum, but doing so, getting employees to that midpoint, that control point, um, that's what CP stands for, in about a four to six year window is important to be have a competitive structure. After that, um, it's not uncommon, even in a performance-based world, to slow down after the midpoint of a structure. And that's why we made the decision to recommend for the, the final steps of the structure at one or a quarter percent. And you know, certainly as, as you get more adept at managing the structure and managing the plan, um, there are things that can be done to um, build performance elements in this, you know, where maybe you know, or employees can, can advance a little bit more rapidly through the structure based on set criteria. I don't think that we, in fact, I know we don't believe that you're there quite yet, but it's something that certainly can be considered. In terms of the, the numbers that you see at the top, in terms of 90% to 115%, mathematically, that's intended to represent the 25th percentile through the 75th percentile of the marketplace. So you're competing in that sweet spot of the market that we're always looking to compete in. And so one of the reasons why we, we try to do that, so if I now if I go to that next slide in terms of the, the challenge, is that there are two types of increases that organizations, especially in a step-based structure, that need to be taken into consideration. That first one, that green, the, the, the structural adjustment. You know, every year, 
you know, that conversation of how much does the market move? You know, do we do CPI? Do we do some other number? And I would, I would argue that CPI isn't always the only, in fact, it is not the only metric you should be taking into consideration. It is a number, but it's not the only number that we need to look at. But that purpose of providing that structural increase is to keep your entire structure competitive with the outside marketplace. If wages in general are increasing by 2%, if, if you don't apply that, then you, you begin to gradually slip in the marketplace. If you provide more than that, obviously you'd be, you know, put yourself in maybe a more advantageous position. The, the yellow is indicative of the employee, individual employees moving through that structure. So from step to step, normally in a step structure, it's an annual step movement, um, assuming the employee has performed adequately for the, the, the prior year, um, but you can also look at it from the lens of performance and some other factors, and arguably an employee who navigates their way from the minimum to the maximum has continued at the very least to demonstrate acceptable performance for the organization. If they're not performing acceptably, um, I think that's a different conversation, and we would strongly advocate for policies that um, retain the ability for the city to withhold a step increase if the employee is not performing acceptably. If we look at the, the next slide here, um, every once in a while we'll get a question or, or an observation from a department, from an employee that, well, I'm, I'm just gonna use some examples here. I'm placed at grade 10, I think I should be at grade 11. We don't disagree that that is something that we, we need to have tidied up or tightened up as, as much as possible in the, in the final deliberation of this. But if you'll notice that there's a significant amount of overlap from one grade to the next. And so if I channel um, our, our prior, um, one of our company founders, um, Charlie Carlson, he would often talk about that there's no point factor system that's so perfect that you can't be one grade off. And that's why we wanna ensure that we have overlap between those grades. So it's not a travesty if, if a job is misplaced in one grade. Now, if it's two or three or four grades, then we really have some work we need to do. And I, I don't think we're giving you anything that, that is, is indeed the case. But I just wanted to make certain that you understood in terms of, of the structure itself, that there is um, sufficient overlap between those two to put you in a position where um, we hope jobs are placed appropriately. And if we need to make adjustments, we, we certainly can at some point. Where the, the work really begins, and I think where a lot of our conversations have, have occurred, especially as, as Caitlin was brought more and more into this process, is that the implementing the structure is, is oftentimes where, where the, the frustrations or the, um, the, the questions arise. You know, so I have not yet had a structure in the typical public sector. I've had a couple of utilities where budget really wasn't a big concern Everywhere else, everywhere else I go, that the budget is indeed, whether it's levy limits, expenditure, restraint, what have you, um, you're dealing with a finite pool of funds. And trying to be fair um, is certainly the goal of this process. You know, whether somebody is happy with the final result, I certainly hope they are. I'm thrilled when employees are happy with the final result. But I also know that what makes one employee happy might upset somebody else. And so again, we're focused um, quite a bit on this notion of, of fairness. And as we look at that, you know, sometimes there are some things that we're not able to take into account. Or you know, in my job, I have at the maximum from, you know, if I look at pay, pay range maximum today to the, the proposed plan, I might have $5,000 more earning potential than what I had before. Unfortunately, due to budget, that's not something that you just are able to move and accomplish overnight. Usually there's a, there's a planned approach to, to meet those dollars out um, you know, over the course of time and have employees move through that structure. And the same token, um, well, length of service is incredibly hard to recognize to the full extent um, for many of the same reasons that you're dealing with a limited pool of funds. And so in doing so, um, and we have talked about these options exhaustively internally, is trying to find out a way of being fair and, and recognizing some of those concerns that I just got done talking about with your available funds. And so, you know, we often describe it as, you know, as I say here, doing as much as you can with what you have. And so coming up with an option, um, set of options for, for doing that. So if I talk about that cost thing, if we can go to the next slide here, um, that 
the numbers provided here, and I'll, I'll let Caitlin um, talk a little bit more, Caitlin or Todd talk a little bit more about these. But if we were to simply implement the structure, um, just providing an increase in pay. And what I mean by that is if an employee is currently paid $25 and the step in the structure that provides an increase in pay is $25 and one cent, under this first line here, the employee would move to 2501. Not ideal and, and certainly um, can be challenging. By the same token, that if at 2501, I've been there, you know, 20, been with the city for 20 years, but that's the step that provides an increase, that would be the placement, even if it was step two or even step one of the structure. Again, not ideal. So if we look at that second line, the proposed implementation is trying to take a little bit of both into consideration. And as we talk about this, the, the, the separation between the long-term employees and the newer employees, and there's always a, 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 a cut point here, is that if employees have at least five years of service to the city, that placing them on the structure at step five at a minimum begins to provide that separation. And, and, some, and there is some value. Um, seniority and tenure certainly are not the only factors. Um, but we go, we're talking about this. Um, we're on slide 25. Um, so as we look at this, and if we go to the last slide here, um, it is a delicate balancing act in terms of what we are trying to accomplish. You know, we want to be. You know, we talked about these these concepts. You know, quite exhaustively here. You know, want to be equitable. You know, has that internal hierarchy been designed in such a fashion that jobs, you know, appropriately um, are layered um, as their duties and responsibilities? Are you competitive with the outside marketplace? And we talked a lot about, you know, competitiveness and the need for maybe a sharper eye towards competitiveness in today's marketplace. Supportiveness, you know, we, again, we talked about that. Those are the three main factors I think employees are focused on first and foremost. Um, certainly the other factors come into play the last three, I, even though I would argue that I think everyone's concerned about all of these, that is it affordable? You know, that, that first pass through year one, can you afford the dollars to, to implement it? It's usually an easier conversation than the next line, sustainable. Is it something that year over year over year, um, is it gonna be able to be sustained by the organization? And I will tell you that every single organization that I work with, or even those that I don't work with that have a pay structure, the sustainability of a compensation structure in the face of, of fairly high inflation and as other costs are increasing, it's gonna be a challenge. I mean, I just don't wanna kind of brush that under the rug, but if we've met those goals and if we've um, identified those and, and, and tackled those, hopefully it's something that you can sign your name to and, and adopt the structure. So that's what I, I was asked to kind of keep this at a fairly high level. I don't know if there's anything else that I, I need to address um, Caitlin and Todd, if I uh, touch on what you, you felt I needed to this evening. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate your uh, help presenting the results. Um, we will be sending out the PowerPoint and also the long version, like Todd said, um, to Patrick's presentation, which goes into a little bit of the detail on um, specifics. And I would just say that anybody on the council, if you have any concerns, questions, that those can be forwarded to either myself or Administrator Wolf. Thank you, Patrick, for your time. Is that it? That's it, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay, moving on to consent. Um, items nine through 20 on the consent, consent agenda. I'm gonna call on Alderperson Felicki Paninski for a motion. File all ROs, reports of officers, receive all reports of committees, and adopt all resolutions and ordinances. Second. This is gonna be a roll call vote. Alderperson Ackley? Aye. Alderperson Decker? Aye. Alderperson Feldy? 
Aye. Alderperson Flecky Paneski. Aye. Alderperson Heideman. Aye. Alderperson Mitchell. Aye. Alderperson Perello. Aye. Alderperson Salazar. Aye. Alderperson Rust. Aye. Alderperson Ramey. Aye. Uh, ten ayes. All right. Um, moving on to report of officers. RO number 18 through 22 by City <coughs> Plan Commission to whom was referred RO number 10, <coughs> 22, 23 by Capital Improvements Commission to whom was referred RO number 1, 22, 23 by City Administrator Todd Wolf, submitting Capital Improvements Program, CIP, request for the year 2023 through 2027 recommends approving the CIP request. Um, I'm gonna call for a motion from Alderperson Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move to receive the IRO and uh, approve the request. Second. Um, I'm gonna call for a roll call vote. Alderperson Ackley? Aye. Alderperson Decker? Aye. Alderperson Feldy? Aye. Alderperson Felicki Paneski? Aye. Alderperson Heideman? Aye. Alderperson Mitchell? Aye. Alderperson Perello? Aye. Alderperson Salazar? Aye. Alderperson Rust? Aye. Alderperson Ramey? Aye. There's 10 ayes. Okay, items 22 through, oh, are we done? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Items 22 through, and through 24 will be referred to their committees. Um, resolutions. Items 25 through 31 will be referred to committees. And then we're on report of committees. Um, roll call vote for, for resolution RC number, sorry, 26 through 22, 23 by Finance and Personnel Committee. Um, Alderperson Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move to receive the RC and adopt the resolution uh, with stack recommendations as presented. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Alderperson Ackley? Aye. Alderperson Decker? Aye. Alderperson Feldy? Aye. Alderperson Felicki Paneski? Aye. Alderperson Heideman? Aye. Alderperson Mitchell? Aye. Alderperson Perella? I think I'm going to abstain on this. Okay. Alderperson Salazar? Aye. Alderperson Rust? Aye. Alderperson Ramey? Aye. It's nine ayes, one abstain. Motion carries. Um, number 33, RC number 27, 22, 23 by Finance and Personnel Committee to whom was referred. I'm going to call for a motion from um, Alderperson Trey Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. I move to receive the RC and adopt the resolution as amended. Second. We'll call vote. Alderperson Ackley? Aye. Alderperson Decker? Aye. Alderperson Feldy? Aye. Alderperson Flicky Paneski? Aye. Alderperson Heideman? Aye. Alderperson Mitchell? Aye. Alderperson Perella? Aye. Alderperson Salazar? Aye. Alderperson Rust? Aye. Alderperson Ramey? Aye. Ten ayes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call for a motion to convene in closed session. I'm going to call on Alderperson um, Flicky Paneski. Um, I move to convene in closed session under the exemption provided by the Wisconsin Statutes 19.851G for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel for the governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is or is likely to become involved. And under the exemption provided in Wisconsin Statutes 19.851F, for the purpose of considering financial, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons which, if discussed in public, 
would be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data, to wit, consideration of the matter of Abigail H. Hernandez versus the City of Sheboygan Police Department, ERD case number CR2021019900, EEOC case number 26G2022000011C, C. This second. Will be, second. This will be a roll call vote. We, can we have to do both. I, I would. Oh. I would suggest that Alder Felicki Paneski also um, make the second motion, and then you vote on them together. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> motion. We're follow his recommendation. Right. Second motion. I move to convene in closed session, under the exemption provided in Wisconsin statutes 19.851G for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel for the governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is or is likely to become involved and under the exemption provided in Wisconsin Statutes 19.851F for the purpose of considering financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons which, if discussed in public, would be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data, to wit, consideration of the matter of Vicki A. Schneider versus the City of Sheboygan, ERD case number CR 20220171, EEOC case number 26G, Two zero two two zero zero four four three. Second. Roll call vote. Alderperson Ackley. Aye. Alderperson Decker. Aye. Alderperson Feldy. Aye. Alderperson Felicki Paneski. Aye. Alderperson Heideman. Aye. Alderperson Mitchell. Aye. Alderperson Perella. Aye. Alderperson Salazar. Aye. Alderperson Rust. Aye. Alderperson Ramey. Aye. Ten ayes. Thank you. Um, Next on the agenda is adjourning the no. meeting, but we are going into closed session and we will not convene after closed session. That will end our, our, that will end our broadcast. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>